it's, it's always good to be with veterans. It's especially good. And it's good to be with business people. And here, where many of you are both, it's, uh, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I spent three years in the military and three and a half decades in the corporate world. The last 10 or so years, I spent traveling on average about 48 weeks a year, a fair amount of which was across at least two time zones, and some of that was international travel. And so I discovered two things about constant travel, such that one, it seemed to speed up growing older. And, and two, it underscored time and again that finding glamour in air travel was as improbable as picking up a book about the stable family unit written by one of the Kardashians. <laughs> So I chose to retire and give my younger colleagues an opportunity to constantly travel and grow older faster. I recently asked my wife Debbie if it ever occurred to her in her wildest dream that I would leave the corporate world and become a full-time writer and speaker. And she kind of pondered the question for a moment and looked at me and said, what makes you think that you would have even been in my wildest dream? <laughs> I opted not to pursue that matter any further. Since I'm going to be speaking about heroes, as I look out across this room, there's a room full of them in here. And I'd like to start by reading a short poem from John Musgrave. You may remember John from Ken Burns' series on Vietnam, where he was seriously wounded and was later retired, medically retired from the Marine Corps. And the poem is entitled, appropriately enough, Heroism. In Vietnam, I learned that the greatest gift of heroism was to lay down your life and die for someone else. In the 35 years since I've been home, I've learned that more often the greatest act of heroism is to take up your life and live for someone else. That by John Musgrave. In late 1969, I was walking in front of Memorial Hall at the University of Georgia when I spotted a Marine captain and two Marine NCOs standing behind a couple of tables upon which were Marine recruiting information. I stopped in, had a look, and was greeted by the Marines. Um, and I picked up a brochure on officer training. I was married and a father. I was about to graduate. I had no interest in being drafted. My best friend had a spot reserved for me in the Air Force Reserves, but I, I had no interest in that. I had decided that I would pursue an active duty path, and the Marines were, well, the Marines. After a bit, the Marine captain introduced himself to me. We had a chance to chat, and I told him of my interest and background. Um, I noticed that he had a chest full of medals, and I assumed that they had been, been earned the hard way, especially that purple one. And I said, you know, there's a war going on. And he kind of looked at me sideways and said, oh, I'm aware of that. And I said, well, if I join up with your outfit, what are my chances of being sent? And he looked at me like that was a really stupid question. <laughs> but he leaned forward into the question, and he looked at me and it said, strong. And if you'd said anything else like, my accounting degree would probably get me in as a finance officer in the Marine Corps, I would have walked away. But instead I offered a handshake and said I can do business with you. And I did, eventually becoming an artillery officer, ready to go where the Marines would send me as a second lieutenant forward observer. But as it turned out, I wasn't sent to Vietnam. I got to Okinawa in 72 and 73 with the 3rd Marine Division, but that's as close as I got. I'd like now to tell you about three people, all friends of mine, all Vietnam veterans, and all who are, in my opinion, very much heroes. It's no coincidence that one is a Marine, for that was my branch of the service. And it's likewise no coincidence that two were in medical care, where that's where I spent the majority of my time in the private sector. On January 31st, 2018, my friend and Druid Hills classmate, Bruce Gant, along with his wife, Vicki, walked across the bridge over the Perfume River and entered Hue, 50 years to the date, after Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, under the command of Captain Chuck Meadows, 
had entered Hue and exchanged heavy gunfire with the enemy troops occupying the city. Bruce visited the Citadel, the MACV compound, and other locations where the Marines had fought a hard-earned hard -earned victory and lasted over slight, slightly over a month. He walked the ground where the 68 battle began as part of the Communist Tet Offensive and where three understrength Marine battalions would face off against a well-concealed, well-entrenched enemy numbered by some to include 10,000. It became a bloody, vicious battle that killed or wounded thousands. It was Bruce's fifth trip back to Vietnam and all had been made with Chuck Meadows who was now a retired Marine Colonel. Bruce had pointed to this trip for quite a while and he, when he got there, the weather was cold, rainy and miserable, much as it had been on his all expense paid trip 50 years earlier. <laughs> Going back to 68, Bruce came into way on a medevac chopper on February the 9th and was assigned to the battalion aid station of 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. Much of the fighting was house to house, room to room, and the Marines were often shooting at and being shot at by enemy at very close range. It was a brawl, and a very lethal, lethal one at that. Bruce had experience in the operating room from a previous duty station at a hospital in Puerto Rico, but nothing could have prepared him for the severity of the wounds that he saw once he was in Hue. He was a mere 20 years old at the time, and he was suturing, removing shrapnel, and dressing wounds from what seemed like a continuous stream of wounded Marines. He was also performing triage, making life or death calls that not too many 20-year-olds would ever be called upon to make. Bruce remembers that many of the Marines would refuse hospitalization after being wounded and would return to their units after treatment, unwilling as they were to leave their buddies still in the fight. And many of those same Marines would return soon thereafter to have their wounds treated for infection. So day after day, the fighting continued. Bruce himself was painfully wounded by shrapnel on February 15th and left Hue on a medevac chopper for six weeks of hospitalization. When he returned to duty in April of 68, he was assigned as a senior corpsman for Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, operating out of Anwa. In October of 68, Echo Company was assigned to Assault Hill 100 as part of Operation Maui Peak in Quang Nam Province. On October 12th, Bruce was wounded again, but he refused evacuation and instead battle-dressed his legs and stayed in the fight, along with many others. When Echo Company finally returned to their Anwa base, they were at less than one half strength. Bruce left Vietnam with two Purple Hearts and a dozen other ribbons for his service there. He returned home and separated from the Navy in 1969. In 1991, Bruce attended the commissioning of the USS Hue City, a guided missile cruiser. He attended several memorial services with the crew of the ship and along with many of the Hue veterans. On Bruce's 2018 trip, he returned to Hill 100 where a tour guide whose father had been a VC and who may very well fought against Bruce and the other Americans was there. While Bruce's service in Vietnam means a lot to him, it's the Marines he served with who mean the most. He admires what they did there, the ferocity with which they fought and sometimes died and their determination in meeting and defeating a likewise determined enemy. And I'm quite sure that many of the Marines who were injured or in need of treatment at Hue or elsewhere would look upon Bruce with appreciation and admiration. Sadly, Bruce's friend Colonel Chuck Meadows died on March 1st, 2018, not long after returning from that 50th anniversary trip. Bruce and Vicki flew out to Portland for the service and General Peter Pace gave the eulogy. Peter Pace was the first Marine to ever occupy the office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and he was also a platoon leader at the Battle of Hue. Bruce is doing well these days despite two Agent Orange cancers and other service related issues that he's had to deal with. I'm honored to be his friend and as a special treat I'd like to introduce to you former Navy Corpsman and Vietnam veteran, Bruce Gant. <laughs> Sir.
Just to change gears for a moment, there's a story of an old retired Marine gunnery sergeant who had been driving his wife bonkers with his increasingly erratic behavior. She was at her wit's end. She didn't know what to do with him, and they were a couple in their 80s. And she was aghast when the gunny was arrested for shoplifting. And she gave him the business over it, telling him in no uncertain terms that since she couldn't do anything with him, uh, that maybe some hard time in the prison system might drive some sense into that skull of his. So in their point in time, they show up in the court, Gunny in his dress blues. <laughs> and the judge says, Gunny, what'd you steal? And he came to attention and said, can of, ink, of a can of peaches, sir. And he says, well, then how many pieces were in that can of peaches? And the gunny says, six pieces, sir. And he said, very well, I'm going to assign one day for each piece in that can of peaches, thereby sentencing you to six days in jail. Down came the gavel. And when his wife heard that, she raised her hand and said, he also stole a can of English peas. <laughs> Captain Robert L. Adams took over Mike Battery, 4th Battalion, 12th Marines, in the spring of 1972. I became his executive officer. He told me that he really needed a good performance in this command so that he could be promoted to major and go on to complete a 20-year career. Well, I told Skipper, as we called him then and I still call him now, that we would see to it that he got that promotion. And Mike Battery performed exceptionally well on his watch. He would eventually get the promotion to major and go on to retire after 20 years. One night at Camp Fuji, Japan, where we uh, shared a Kwanzaa hut, the skipper, myself, and two other lieutenants um, were, were in the Kwanzaa hut, and the, Captain Adams was sitting on the edge of his bed, scratching the back of his heel with his index finger. And I suppose one could scratch more interesting places, but he would occasionally hold up with his thumb and forefinger and announce that that's one less piece of communist steel that I'll have to carry around with me. Well, it wasn't long before our interest was piqued and we wanted to know what had happened to have caused that communist steel to be in his foot. And he went on to tell us the harrowing story of, in 1967, being assigned to command two 155-millimeter howitzers on an isolated hill in Vietnam without any Marine infantry protection. He had 40 Marines there under his command who were there to man the guns and provide fire direction and support. He also had a contingent of 20 popular forces, uh, Vietnamese, Vietnamese, South Vietnamese militia of sorts, um, who were there to, uh, to provide protection. Well, Lieutenant Adams wasn't especially crazy about the arrangement, but uh, orders were orders. That's Georgia Tech, isn't it? <laughs> um, but it, take, it didn't take the North Vietnamese long before they sent a battalion in a late night all-out assault against the compound. Um, the popular forces who were there to protect the Marines instead turned the machine guns on the Marines. So all of a sudden, Bob Adams has a North Vietnamese battalion in his face and popular forces shooting at him from inside the wire. Lieutenant Adams was in a bunker directing as best he could the activities of his Marines when a grenade exploded near his feet, peppered his foot, leg, back, and hit with fragments. A bullet came through, hit the back of his helmet, and scraped the back of his head. Uh, a bullet struck the um, machine gunner who was next to him, striking him in the chest, and as the machine gunner would fall forward onto the hot barrel of the M60, he would wake up and continue firing. So both Marines stayed in the fight. There was low cloud cover, so air support was not available to them. And in spite of the numerical disadvantage, the Marines fought off the attackers for more than two hours. But as casualties began to mount, Lieutenant Adams directed that thermite grenades be put into the breech blocks of the two howitzers to disable them and render their use, render their non-use to the enemy. There was an Australian in the compound with the Marines, and he was finally able to lead an escape into the jungle for the surviving Marines, almost all of whom were wounded. Lieutenant Adams couldn't walk and insisted upon staying, but his Marines evacuated him. And after a journey of several kilometers, the survivors were finally able to reach an area where a helicopter extraction could be made. 
the bodies of 11 Marines were left on the hill. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Adams was evacuated to Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii, where his wife resided. The Marines went back for those bodies on several occasions, but they met such stiff resistance that they were unable to collect them, and so there the body stayed. Well, the news that his Marine dead had been left on the battlefield hit Lieutenant Adams especially hard. He had a hard time coming to grips with it. He knew that under the circumstances, the surviving Marines, himself included, would have had a very difficult time gathering the bodies of those 11 brothers and evacuating them. And while he knew that, it provided him very little comfort. And then in 1999, a dig on the hill identified 12 Caucasian males, and it was thought to be the 11 Marines and an Army soldier who had been in the compound with them. Five of the remains were identified as Marines. As the positive identifications were made, Bob Adams made it a point to find the next of kin, an elderly mother or a brother or a sister, and pay a condolence call to that family's deceased Marine some more than three decades after their deaths. He's been to New Mexico and Oregon and Washington, D.C. from his Seattle home to comfort those family members with their Marines, and yes, they are still and always will be his Marines. He's been back to Vietnam and to that hill. He's seen unexploded munitions on the ground and a boot, a helmet, a poncho, and a riddled and rotted flak jacket. It was loud and chaotic then, obviously, but it's quiet and overgrown now. And he still remembers his Marines. When I told Bob that I wanted to use his story in a speech, he gave me his permission, but he emphatically insisted that he was no hero. I told him that I disagreed, that he'd always been a hero to me, and since I'm the writer and the speaker, a hero he would remain. I'm proud to have had Bob Adams as my CO, and I'm even prouder to have such a man as my friend, Semper Fi Skipper. Now for the continuing saga of the old gunny. The gunny got out of jail, he did his time, and he made up with his wife, and they had recently had a good report from their doctor that they're in good physical health for an 80-year-old couple, but their memories were beginning to compress. Imagine that, right? So one night they're lying in bed, the, she doing a crossword puzzle and the gunny thumbing through a magazine. And when he finished, he said, I'm going to the kitchen for a drink of water, dear. Can I bring you anything? And she says, well, a bowl of vanilla ice cream would be really good, but you better write it down. He said, no, I got it. And she says, well, then some strawberries would be good. Go along with that, but write it down. He said, no, I got it. And she said, well, some whipped cream with a cherry on top would be really good. But here, and she hands him a pen and piece of paper, says, go ahead and write it down. Well, he doesn't, and off he goes to the kitchen. He comes back 20 minutes later and hands her a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> and she looks at it and looks at him with a fair amount of aggravation and says, I knew you should have written it down. You forgot my toast. <laughs> I get the impression that some of us can identify with that. Huh? The last count I saw showed 58,267 names on the wall at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Eight of those names are women, women who died while nursing the wounded. Had it not been for those doctors and nurses, those corpsmen and medics, those pilots and the speed of the evacuation, there would no doubt be thousands more names inscribed upon that black granite wall. I asked my friend Dottie Haygood, who served as a first lieutenant in the Army Nurse Corps in Vietnam, to provide me some of her memories of that time, and this is Dottie's story. Dottie arrived in the Republic of Vietnam in November of 1969. She was 22 years old and had been an RN for a little over a year. She was accompanied by her roommate Pat from nursing school, who had joined the Army with her. They were looking for the real Vietnam experience, wearing fatigues and combat boots instead of white uniforms, and working in the grittiest of departments. Pat requested ICU, and Dottie opted for casualty receiving slash emergency. She was too young and naive to realize that she didn't have the requisite knowledge or experience to do what was expected of her, so she just did it. They got patients by helicopter directly from the field where combat medics or corpsmen had applied first aid. 
The medical staff quickly assessed the injuries, started IV fluids and or blood, ordered lab and x-rays and prepped for surgery. They literally came in the front door and went out the back to the operating room. One night Dottie was helping go through the belongings of a soldier brought in dead on arrival. She found in his wallet a prom picture with his girlfriend. It was real and gripping and tragic and she couldn't help but cry. And there were many such stories of youthful innocence back home, ending in heartache in a menacing faraway land. Dottie couldn't help but notice too that the politics of, of the war were often hard to decipher. Casualties for a particular battle would often be reported as one total, but Dottie knew all too well that her hospital alone had treated at least that many. For a nurse, it was hard, grinding, unrelenting work, and it would have been a near impossible job for someone whose heart really wasn't in it and fully in it. I'd like to finish by reading from Dottie's own words now, and I'm quoting her. Many nights I'd be awakened by the sounds of artillery. I would think, I need to get up. They would be calling me soon. And a minutes later, a knock on the door, and Lieutenant, we need you in receiving. After I got home, the sound of thunder would cause the same reaction. Much has been reported about the drug abuse and sexual promiscuity that was rampant in the war zone, people trying to block out the pain and stress any way they could. But that wasn't everyone. There were many of us who worked hard, went to chapel for comfort, developed real and lasting relationships, and were committed to doing whatever we could to make a difference in the lives of those young men who were giving their lives for our country. They would come into our ER when they could just to talk to an American woman. I sensed then that some would never be able to get over the experiences they were going through. Two weeks after I arrived in country, I met my future husband, a helicopter pilot stationed nearby. Our marriage has lasted well over 40 years, and when I came home, it was such a comfort that we understood what the other had gone through. I told someone that I wouldn't trade my experience for a million dollars, but you get, couldn't pay me enough to do it again. In my 40 plus years of nursing, I've never seen anything worse than what I saw over there. And I developed a confidence that with God's help, I could handle anything that came my way. That from former Army nurse Dottie Haygood. There are those 58,000 names on the wall, which were overwhelmingly young Americans who never got the chance to walk a daughter down the aisle or play catch with a grandson or order a book over the internet. They never had a chance to start a business or coach a little league team or write a beautiful piece of music. They were those who, in Mr. Lincoln's words, gave the last full measure of devotion. What they have done for us and will continue to do for us is to remind us that our men and women in uniform have lives of value. And that value is worthy of our care and our respect and our appreciation. They've taught us that American service members and their families, even in an unpopular war, are always the ones who suffer the most. And they validated by the mere weight of those 58,000 names that they deserve the same eternal national group as do the fallen at Bunker Hill or Gettysburg or Normandy. Gant, Adams, and Haygood, American heroes all. There is just an honorable legacy, an American legacy. G.K. Chesterton said, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. And this finally from poet and disabled Gulf War veteran Stanley Victor Paskovich who said, hopefully one day wars will be fought only in movies and may the best producer win. Thank you very much. Thank you.